Hey, let's pray together. Oh God, uh, your word is a lamp, a light to our feet. It shows us the way. It shows us how to live. It shows us how to, how to travel closer and closer to you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would illuminate that pathway this morning, that your spirit would show us what you want to say to us in this passage from Amos that we're going to look at. Draw us close to you in it. Show us a way to go, a way to turn, a way to, to, to be closer and closer to you from this word, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, over the last few weeks, we have been looking at the book of Amos. And Amos, you probably know, is what we call one of the minor prophets. And that is not because Amos was a little guy, a minor person. Amos is actually quite a significant person. But his book is short, and so we call him one of the minor prophets. And Amos is a guy who lives in the southern kingdom of Israel at a time when the nation was divided. And God calls Amos, who is just a farmer and a sheep raiser, he's a business owner essentially, and hasn't been trained as a formal prophet. God calls Amos from the southern kingdom to go to the northern kingdom because in the northern kingdom there are all these horrific injustices occurring. And God wants Amos to come and tell these people in the northern kingdom how terrible their actions are and even how false their worship is. And so Amos is like this outsider coming from the south, going to the north, and bringing this word from God. And it is a word that brings the possibility of hope The people in the northern kingdom could change if they want to, but primarily it's a message of punishment and destruction that is going to come because of their atrocious behavior. And then at the very end of the book of Amos, Brad's going to preach on this in a couple weeks, at the very end of Amos we get a ton of hope, but we have to wait for that, so that'll that'll be coming. Uh, Today, though, in Amos, uh, we're going to look at chapter 7, and by chapter 7, Amos has moved from a very brief calling uh, scenario, it was just one verse long, to a little one verse summary, to a bunch of sermons, and now, in the book of Amos, there's this series of visions. In fact, there are five visions, and we're going to read three of them today, and that's going to bring us something new. Uh, In the last three weeks, we have observed a lot about the justice of God because that is the primary consideration in the book of Amos. Hebrew is mishpat, justice. And last week, we talked about the coupling of mishpat and tzedakah, how justice and righteousness go together and what that looks like because the justice of God is not exactly like the justice of human beings. It's deeper and richer. And so over these three weeks, we've talked about the fact that we define justice by God's word alone. God for us tells us what justice is. We've talked about how to see justice and to do justice. When we look at other people, we have to put on these glasses of mercy and we see people through the mercy of God and only then do we know how to respond in justice to others. And then last week, we talked about this amazing connection that exists between worship and justice. Today, though, we are going to discover as Amos goes to the northern kingdom and brings these visions of punishment that he has, we are going to discover that there is one way that the northern kingdom, and each of us too, can actually access the mercy aspect of God's justice. So we're learning about God's justice, but if you want to have God's mercy in your life, which is part of God's justice, there's there's one way to do that, and Amos shows us how today. So here, the word of God from Amos chapter 7. Like I said, these are visions Amos has, and we're going to read the first three together. So hear the word of God from the beginning of chapter 7. This is what the Lord God showed me. He was forming locusts at the time the latter growth began to sprout. It was the latter growth after the king's mowings. When they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, Oh Lord, forgive, I beg you. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord God was calling for a shower of fire, and it devoured the great deep 
and was eating up the land. Then I said, O Lord God, cease, I beg you. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was in the sixth grade, my uh, teacher's name was Mr. Horn. And Mr. Horn was well known in the entirety of Woodrow Elementary School as the meanest teacher there was. In fact, I remember in, in the fifth grade, we, we had this day, this is how it used to be, you, you would find out who your teacher was before you left for the summer even, I guess which was nice, but that's how it was. And I remember being in my fifth grade class and hoping I would not get Mr. Horn and then hearing that I got Mr. Horn and I was terrified. And so one day in the sixth grade, um, I had gotten to know Mr. Horn, and he was as scary as I had been led to believe. He would yell and scream. He honestly would throw chalk at students and throw erasers, and he was well known if you got in big trouble, he would sit you at this table next to the class, and then he would yell at you in front of everyone until you cried. And let me tell you, you do not want to cry in the sixth grade. I thought this was kind of funny, but you all were like, oh, that's sad. (laughs) It is sad. Yeah, it was sad. Um, But anyway, one day I was in another classroom because part of what we did in the sixth grade was we traded classes a little bit, I guess, to try to get ready for junior high. So we didn't do that a lot. Mr. Horn was my main teacher, but we would go to other classes. And this, I remember, was math class. I had math class with Mrs. Rimsing, and I got in trouble because I was talking too much. Go figure. And Mrs. Rimsing looked at me and she said, go back to Mr. Horn, go back to your homeroom. And there was silence in the class because everybody knew how horrible this punishment was. And they all looked at me and I remember gulping and I remember begging something like, oh, Mrs. Rimsing, I'll be good, I promise. You know, that whole, like, no, you have to go. And so I I left the room and I walked around the block of classrooms. This is outside in California, you know, you have outside corridors. I'm walking around, and I'm walking as slow as I possibly can, because I know I am really in for it, and I know I had it coming. I was in trouble. And so walking there as slow as I could, I remember I stopped at one point, and I leaned up against the wall, and I prayed. I said, oh, God, please, I'll do anything. Just don't make, let me cry. Let me be strong, because I did not want to, no matter how bad Mr. Horn yelled, I did not want to cry in front of the other students. So, God, please protect me, save me. I don't know the language I use, but I've remembered this my whole life, this prayer that I prayed. And I did feel this kind of strength after I prayed, and I'm like, okay, here I go. So I went in, and the door was open because it was a hot day, and, and I stepped into the classroom just over the threshold of the door, and I just stood there. And Mr. Horn was teaching his math class. He was up at the board writing with chalk. And I thought, that chalk is going to come my way any second. (laughs) I'm just sitting there, and he's talking, talking, talking. And it just went on. I stood there, and he kept teaching, and I kept standing there. And then at one point, as he's talking to the class, he says to them, and I am not making this up, true story. He says, boy, I have new contact lenses, and they are stuck to the roof of my eyelids, and I can't see a thing. And so he's walking around blind, not able to see, and I'm just standing there waiting. And the entire classroom went by that way. Kids in the class kept looking at me, and they'd like mouth to me, Steve, what are you doing? I'm like, I have to stand here. And then other students lined up to go into the next class, and they were right behind me, but I'm standing inside, and they're like, get out, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm supposed to be here. And I just stand there, and it went on and on, and Mr. Horn never saw me, just waiting there. <laughs> Now, I don't remember, I probably got in trouble later because Mrs. Remsing probably talked to Mr. Horn and that's how I got in trouble. But for that moment, at least, 
My, the, the punishment was stayed. It was not happening. It was delayed. Now, the people in the northern kingdom, they are in way bigger trouble than I was. And they have it coming. And they should know it. Now, they don't really know it. Amos is telling them, and so they, they should know it. But they, they are in trouble. They are committing these horrific injustices. We've talked about those in previous weeks, this debt slavery, this, this lack of representation in the court system, the false worship. They're doing all kinds of terrible things. And so when the punishment of God comes to them, it is absolutely justice. They do definitely have it coming, but it is, they have a way out like I did. I mean, when I prayed and I asked God to intervene to help me, that was my way out. And in, in my sixth grade mind, I really believed that was God's intervention. That was a miracle. In fact, to this day, I still think God had something to do with that. <laughs> that was my way out. And the northern kingdom, they have this way out as well, even if they don't see it. But Amos shows them that because their way out is a way to access the mercy aspect of God's justice. Because part of God's justice, as we've been talking about, is this layer of mercy and goodness and care for the poor and the oppressed. That is part of God's justice, not part of human justice, but it is definitely part of God's justice. And there is only one way to access that mercy, to get that mercy, and Amos shows them what it is. But before we answer that question, let's look at these three visions that Amos has. First, he has this vision of locusts. These insects come, and this is this punishment God has devised. They come, and they devour the crops. Amos, remember, is a farmer, so this is certainly terrifying to Amos. And not only do these insects come and devour the crops and put these farmers out of business, but they devour what Amos says is the second harvest. The first harvest of the season would go to the king. It was like paying the king's taxes. We talked about Jeroboam uh, last week or the week before, and, and Jeroboam would receive this first, first uh, harvest. That's not the harvest that the locusts ate, so Jeroboam gets that. The locusts come, and they, they eat the second harvest, and that's the harvest that, that supports the farmers themselves. So this is utterly devastating. And like I said, terrifying for Amos. It's death. Amos is, is horrified. And these locusts, they also eat the grass. That's part of this, this punishment as well. And so not only are the things that grow destroyed, but any livestock or cattle or, or any kind of farm animals that eat the grass, they are also gone. So you are talking about famine and death. That's this vision that Amos has. But something delays that punishment. God says it shall not pass. Somehow, between that punishment and that statement from God, something happens that accesses the mercy aspect of God's judgment, justice. And then we have the second vision, and that vision, oh, I love this, because when was the last time you actually heard a sermon on judgment by fire? Fire raining down from heaven. I think we used to hear those all the time. I think that was before I was born. But this is one of those passages where God says, I am going to rain fire down. And that fire, God says in, in this second vision, is so bad that it is going to destroy everything, even the depths, Amos writes. And the depths, you know, the Hebrews had this concept that the, the mountains and the continents were, were rooted in this, the depths of the sea. And, and this fire is even going to consume that. So you are talking about deep and complete destruction, this shower of fire or rain of fire that they have coming. But the same thing happens. Between Amos describing this, this vision of, of the shower of fire and when God says that also shall not be, something happens that accesses the mercy aspect of God's justice. But then we have the third vision. And that vision in our translation says it's a plumb line, but it's actually a wall. God says, I will put a wall in my people. God's sitting on top of that wall, and God has the material that that wall is made out of in his hand. We've got one of those really fun, I think. These are so rare, uh, but we have a moment here in, this, in these, these two passive verses where there is a word that we don't know. 
It's very rare, but it's fun to have a translation problem like this. Um, the translators have historically translated this as a plumb line, which is some kind of tool that carpenters use to make sure something is straight. So it's a, a straight wall. The Hebrew word is anak, and it's actually the word for tin. But because of context and for some other reasons, some translators have thought, oh, this must be a, 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 also a word for a tool. This is not a word that occurs anywhere else in the Bible. And Amos uses it four times here, which is really fun. Uh, but the point of what Amos is saying is about the wall. Now, it is, I think, probably a tin wall. It's a wall made out of a substance. And the point is not that this wall is crooked or straight. The point is that there is a wall dividing the people of, of Israel. And God is sitting on top of it. And God has this material in his hand. And God says, Amos, what do you see? And Amos says, I see that material, that tin, a knock. I see that in, in your hand. And whether it's uh, people who are crooked or straight because it's a plumb line, or whether it's because there's a wall between people, it's the, same, it's the same interpretation. It's the same difference. If you are on one side of the wall, you have crossed this line. You have crossed this boundary. God has said, this is what justice is, and you are not doing it. So you're on the other, other side of it, or you are on the right side. It's just one way or the other. You are either doing the justice of God, or you are not. And so you deserve punishment, or you don't. Don't. That is what this vision means that Amos is describing as he talks about this, this tin wall and God sitting on top of it. Now, um, it, uh, another thing that's kind of interesting about this word, a knock, is that this word meaning, meaning tin or plumb line also sounds like a, a Hebrew word for moaning or mourning. So it's like this moaning wall or this wailing wall, this, this wall that causes sadness in the midst of people. Um, later on in the fourth vision Amos, that we didn't read, Amos talks about summer fruit, and he does the same kind of thing where the word for summer means also like the word for end. So it, it kind of makes sense that this is a tin wall, a moaning wall, uh, a mourning wall that, that is dividing the people. But this vision is different. As God lays down this wall and says, this is this side and this is that side, nothing happens. There's no intervention. There's, there's nothing that accesses the mercy aspect of God's justice. And instead of God saying, this shall not pass, it passes. It comes. The, the horror, the punishment goes forward in this vision, in this, in this one. And Amos actually writes that God destroys the, the nation of Israel, that the royal houses of Jeroboam and that these other worship places, that they will all be destroyed and will be killed essentially by the sword, Amos says. So what's the difference? Why in the first two visions does God give mercy and have this stay of justice. In the first two visions, the people of Israel, they have punishment coming, but they are standing just like I did in my sixth grade class on the other side of that, that, that threshold, just waiting for their punishment, and it doesn't happen. It doesn't come because God gives them mercy. But in this third vision, that doesn't happen. Judgment comes. Punishment comes. Well, in the first vision with the locusts, between the punishment and God saying, okay, I won't do it, is this moment where Amos repents. He repents on behalf of the nation of Israel. And that's the missing piece. And we're going to talk about this in a second, but it is, it is missing in our culture, in our society, and probably in some of our churches too. The idea and practice of honest-to-goodness repentance. Because that's what's required to access the mercy of God. Repentance. Amos says in the first instance, the locust comes, and Amos says, oh Lord, forgive. I beg you. It's like this one word repenting moment. Oh God, forgive. I beg you. And it's this imperative, and he's begging, and you can see this urgency in what he says. And so God says, okay, I won't do it. And in the second vision, the fire, God, uh, Amos says, Oh, Lord, cease, I beg you. It's like, God, stop crying out in, in this, in asking, in coming to God and saying, Will you not do this? And God does not do that. 
And in both of those, in the locust and the fire there, we have this little interlude too where Amos says, how can Jacob stand? And this is unusual for it to be Jacob, but often uh, authors will use the name of one of these great fathers of the faith to substitute for the name of the nation of Israel. He does that later in our text with, with Isaac, and that's often the case. But here he actually uses Jacob. It's a little unusual, but suffice it to say he's talking about Israel this northern kingdom. How will Israel stand, he says, because that kingdom is so small. They need your help so bad. This nation, the northern kingdom, they are exploiting the needy, but it turns out they are even more needy. They are tiny. They are puny. They need you so much. But then in that third vision, the vision of this tin wall, there's no repentance. And so punishment comes. And God says during that third vision, I will never again pass them by. I, that moment where you're standing in the, in the threshold waiting for the punishment to come and God stays it, God says that is never going to happen again. I am not going to just overlook this again. And so to get that mercy of God, we have this two-step repentance moment that happens for Amos. The first step is to ask, stop, forgive. And the second step is to admit need. And, when you, and, there, and built into that, that two-step of, of asking and admitting need, there is absolutely an assumption of change that this repentance moment is genuine. It's not fake. The people of the northern kingdom can change their ways. And if they repent, and they do, God will Bring mercy. The problem is the northern kingdom, they don't think they need to repent. They don't think they're doing anything wrong. For them, their life is super secure. The kingdom is wealthy. They are able to stand on the backs of the poor and oppressed and have this wonderful life as far as they're concerned. So what on earth would they have to repent for? And that might sound familiar. When we think about our culture today and even our churches today, we avoid repentance because things are so secure. We can often go about our day, days never even thinking about the fact that we might need to repent. We have this version of the Christian faith that just says, hey, if we just live a good life and we're kind to others, then I'm sure God will be good to me. Kind of a therapeutic benefit version of Christianity where God, you know, God will make me feel good about myself and keep me happy as long as I'm a kind person. And, uh, and repentance has no place in a faith like that. Now, of course, that is not the Christian faith. That is a reduced version of the Christian faith. Repentance is missing from a lot of people's faith. But without repentance, we miss God's mercy. Repentance is absolutely central to the Christian faith. I mean, think even of the um, a Reformation, 16th century. You know, Martin Luther comes, he posts those 95 theses on the Wittenberg door, and in, that, in those theses are several that have to do with the selling of indulgences. Remember this? Indulgences were things that people would buy, and if they bought with money these indulgences, then they would receive the forgiveness of sins. And that went against the very core, the very foundation of the Christian faith. And when we talk about it, we are always, I think, talking about the corruption in the church. Well, yeah, that, the church shouldn't have done that because they were corrupt, they were greedy, they were selling indulgences and getting their money for that, and it was just greed. And of course, that is part of it. That's, it was corrupt and it shouldn't have been, and, and Luther was concerned about that. But that was not the main thing Luther was concerned about. The main thing that Luther was concerned about was that by buying these indulgences, people were not repenting. There was no change and that, for Luther, was this amazing thing that should never be overlooked. To have repentance in our life. To ask God for help. To, to admit that we need God and to do it in such a way that we are going to change our lives. To do that and have that moment is how we bring mercy into our lives. It's one of the best things about being a Christian. Repentance. And we even see God do it in a way because in the text that we read when Amos cries out in repentance on behalf of the northern kingdom, 
it says that God relented. Now, God doesn't have to he doesn't have to repent the way Amos has to repent. He doesn't have to repent the way the northern kingdom has to repent. He doesn't have to repent the way we repent. But there is an aspect of repentance here. God actually changes his mind. He's like, here's this, this punishment I'm going to bring you. But then Amos repents and God relents. He changes his mind and he brings grace. But we have even more mercy than what Amos is talking about. Because for Amos, all that he ever gets is a delay, a stay of execution, and God says, I'm never going to do this again. Instead, because we're Christians, and we know more than Amos knows, we discover that God sends Jesus into the world. God doesn't overlook sin anymore. He doesn't just let it pass by. He doesn't just delay standing there waiting for Mr. Horn to throw chalk at me. It's going to happen eventually, but I hope it doesn't happen soon. It's not just a delay. It is a, a, a fix. God actually does something about sin so that today when we repent, we can claim the cross. We can claim what Jesus Christ does on the cross. That's where repentance leads for us. God has now done something about sin once and for all. And so these punishments that, that Amos is talking about that, that are going to come, that they repent from, those punishments fall on Jesus Christ on the cross. God doesn't pass them by. He doesn't overlook them. But God still brings mercy. God still takes care of this. And in his concept of justice, what, what divine justice really is, we find this layer or this thread, this aspect of justice that is full of mercy. God doesn't ignore it. Like maybe Mr. Horn was just ignoring me to torment me or something. I really don't know what happened. God doesn't ignore it. He deals with it once and for all in Jesus Christ. And even Jesus has called us to repent. And so this week, another homework assignment for you. Spend a little bit of time every day all week in repentance. Think about what you have to repent from and repent. And let God take that from you. Because by doing that, you will receive mercy. Every day, the mercy of God will flow, just like Amos shows us in these visions. Thanks be to God. Amen.